Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to South, and we're so glad you're here. My name is Mike, and this is Natalie, and along with the band and all the crew, we want to welcome you today, especially if you're new around here. We're going to start by singing a couple songs together, so we're going to ask you guys to stand up and lift your voices with us.
Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power. Well, hey, good morning. My name is Peter, and I get to serve on our staff team here at Southland's Nicholasville campus. And hey, be honest, how many of you were just late to the 930 this morning? Anyone out there? Yeah, there we go. Uh, Hey, great to see you. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for your patience as our renovation project here continues. It'll be really cool over the next few months to just get to watch the transformation happen right in front of our eyes. And speaking of transformation, last Sunday was Easter, and I'm so, so excited to let you know that across all of our campuses, we got to celebrate over 100 baptisms here at South. Man, it, it was an incredible, incredible experience. We were out at the pond. It was cold, all right? It was cold. Oh, man, it was chilly out there. It was not the weather we have this weekend, but it was still really, really awesome. Thanks for coming out and celebrating with us if you were able to do that, and thanks for making Easter really memorable here at Southland. Well, I had a buddy growing up, and he used to have all these really lame jokes, and he would come up to me and put his hand on the back of my shoulder, and he'd look me in the eyes, and he'd say, guess who's back? And I'd look at him, and I'd be like, who? Who's back? And he'd tap me twice on the back, and he'd say, it's your back. Yeah, it was bad. It was bad. But I'm going to steal from him this morning with the little guess who's back because Jesus Prom is back. Man, we are excited to be having Jesus Prom again this year. After a couple years off, we're going to go back to a traditional in-person prom experience for our friends with special needs. And if you're new around Southland, Jesus Prom is something we do here to carry out our mission of loving God and loving people by just providing an experience that some people with special needs don't get to have, which is prom. And so we're gonna come right here at the Nicholasville campus and celebrate with dinner and dancing and photo booths and all kinds of awesome stuff. And it's really cool because this year, all of the volunteer spots are filled up, which means as the host of the party, Nicholasville campus, your job as the host is simply to invite to invite people with special needs to come and to join and to have a great experience. So if you know someone at work or in your neighborhood who has special needs or you know a caretaker of someone with special needs, we would love for you to extend an invitation to them. You can go to southland.church forward slash Jesus prom and find all the information you need. But man, please be praying about who needs to come and just experience a little joy on Friday night, May 6th. Well, maybe the most audacious claim that Jesus made while he was here on earth was when he said in John chapter 14, I am the way. And that claim is a big one, but a lot of us around here believe and take Jesus at his word. And so we try to live life the way that Jesus lived. And one aspect of that was living together. Around here, we use these words in community. And really what that means is we believe it's easier to walk with Jesus when you're walking with other people. And so I'm really excited to let you know that this week we've got a lot of new groups launching 
uh, on our website, southland.church forward slash groups. So if you've been praying about getting in community, if you've been praying about getting other people around you, now's a great time to do that. So you can go to southland.church forward slash groups, and we've got uh, recreational groups, service groups, Bible studies, care groups, all kinds of opportunities for you to walk with people who are walking towards Jesus. And if you're already in a group, would you just be praying for anyone in this room who needs to make that step? Or would you be praying about who God is going to send your way to join your community this week? Well, we're going to continue on in our series, Why Not Now, that we kicked off on Easter. And John is with us this week, so we are going to jump in with all of our campuses across Central Kentucky as we get ready to hear the message. Thanks for being with us this week. In case you ever visit uh, the great state of Texas, you need to know that in Austin, they have a Mexican restaurant, and outside of this Mexican restaurant is a big sign, and they love uh, to put some fun messages on the sign for people who are driving by on a very visible road. Uh, here are a few of my favorite messages they've put out there. The main function of the little toe is to make sure all of the furniture is in place. <laughs> and you know this, like, few things will make you want to say a bad word, quite like stubbing your toe. Is that true? Uh, here's another good one. You think you know stress? When I was a kid, if you missed a TV show, you just missed it forever. <laughs> like, do you remember not being able to record things or not being able to rewind things? Commercials would come on, and man, I would sprint to the bathroom. I'd sprint to the kitchen, back to my seat, because you didn't want to miss what was happening on different strokes. You know, the next day at school, everybody was talking about it. Or you're watching your favorite TV show, and the phone rings. Remember this? And you're like, Who's calling during happy days? Fawns is getting ready to jump the chicken shack. This is an important moment. Remember those days? Uh, my daughter and I recently ate at uh, Waffle House, and speaking of signs, they had a little sign by the cash register that said, you don't have to be crazy to work here. We'll train you. And we were, we were seated uh, at the counter watching the waitresses interact with the man who was cooking. And I'll be honest, it just seemed like a family. Uh, they were joking, cutting up, having a good time, poking fun, teasing, and they were kind of involving everybody that was, that was eating in there. But there was this tense kind of awkward exchange that happened. One of the waitresses got a customer's order wrong, and so the cook had made the wrong plate, and he was not happy about it. So he dumps it out in the trash can and starts fixing another plate, and when he gets it done, I'm sitting like two feet from all this happening. He hands her the plate, and when he does, he kind of shakes his head at her in disgust like she's the village idiot. I will never forget this as long as I live. She just stood there with this numb look on her face, and then she did this. And she just took the plate and walked off. That was a good response, right? But again, like a family, really good moments, really bad moments. Kind of like this couple on TV from years ago. Take a look at this. I'm not scared. Okay? <laughs> what happened tonight caused me to have a revelation. Which was what? That I'm always the one who has to back down around here. I, I constantly have to shut my mouth to keep the peace. Excuse me? Oh. <laughs> well, this is unbelievable. You're gonna act like a big baby because you didn't get your way tonight? Try every night, okay? I'm talking about 12 years of marriage now. You, you have to get your way on everything all the time. That is not true. Oh, oh, it's not true? How about the dog that I've always wanted, huh? Hey, w wait a minute. If you don't always get what you wanted, then I guess we have one. Hey, Floppy, here, boy. <laughs> floppy. That's right, Floppy. You can't even let me name my imaginary. <laughs> it's 
family, right? We have these disagreements. We have these differences. I heard about a dad who wanted to teach his four young children an important life lesson. So he brought them into the dining room, and he set up four mason jars on the table. And the first mason jar was whiskey. The uh, second mason jar was cigarette smoke. third mason jar was chocolate syrup. And the fourth mason jar was filled with good, healthy soil. And he took an earthworm and put it in each jar and then sealed the lid. Well, the results were inevitable. First three earthworms, one in whiskey, one in cigarette smoke, and the one in chocolate, they all died. But the fourth earthworm in the healthy soil lived. So he looked at his kids and he said, okay, kids, what important life lesson can we learn from this illustration? His teenage son said, well, I guess if we drink, smoke, and eat chocolate, we won't get worms. Is that, the, <laughs> is that it? Probably not to take away the dad was looking for. I've had those moments. You've probably had those moments before. But here's the thing. Every family, and I mean every single family, it has the potential to experience really high highs and really low lows. That's not unique to us. It's not new to this generation of family. As a matter of fact, if you recall, Jesus was a part of a family. He had mom and dad, Mary and Joseph. And I'm sure there were moments when he was a little boy. Can you imagine being the parents to the Son of God? I mean, think about that. Like, Jesus, go take a bath. And then they go check on him, and he's just moonwalking across the surface of the bathtub, right? That'd be a frustrating moment. The dirt's not going to come off unless you get under the water. Or think about being a sibling to Jesus. Four of his siblings are named. His brothers are named in the Gospels. He even says he had sisters, plural, so we know he had at least two. He would have been one of at least seven siblings. But can you imagine chores? Right? Jesus is told he has to mow the yard, and the other kids are like, that's not fair. Like, he can tell the grass not to grow. Like, this isn't, a, this isn't an equal thing. But it wasn't just that family that Jesus was a part of. I find this fascinating that all four gospel writers include these interactions that Jesus had with a family that had three siblings. But we're not told if they grew up down the road from Jesus or if they went to the same synagogue school or maybe they had the same after-school employment. We don't know. We just know that Mary and Martha feel close enough to Jesus to send him a note. And the note says very simply, your dear friend is very sick. It's their brother. It's Lazarus. And by the time Jesus gets to the home of Mary and Martha, Lazarus is dead. And the two sisters say the exact same thing to Jesus at separate times, which was this. Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. There's deep sadness in that statement. There's deep anger in that statement. And yet, Martha kind of takes a step back. And then she looks at Jesus and she says, but even now, even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. In other words, as bad as this situation is with their brother dying, she knows there will be no good, no outcome that will be good unless she invites Jesus to help. Now, I'm not naive I recognize that not every message that's put on a sign out there is fun-loving and joyful. I mean, we had tornadoes hit western Kentucky, and I remember driving down Nicholasville Road the day after, and there was a little sign that just said, pray for our friends and family who lost everything. Poignant and needed. We all needed to feel the weight of that. Or when Russia invaded Ukraine, you started seeing these little yard signs pop up around central Kentucky that were blue and yellow color of the Ukrainian flag. And again, pray for Ukraine. See, it doesn't matter if it's a natural disaster that hits or if it's a a war that breaks out. We have a tendency as a country to collectively come together and we, we pray. And the reason we pray is we believe God can do things we cannot do. I believe that. Mary and Martha believe that. So friends, if I was to give you and your family members a sign today that was blank, and I said, here's a pen, you write on your sign whatever word you want to right now, what are you struggling with? What does your family need help with? Would you write the word addiction on there? Maybe you got a family member who's wrestling with alcohol abuse or a cousin who's in the throes of heroin or pill addiction, and man, you're just, you've tried everything. Maybe you would write the the word divorce. You'd say, I just feel like I'm being forced to pick a side and I love everybody involved. Maybe you would write the word bankruptcy. 
It's a financial thing, John. We just, we can't get our head above water. We're just sinking constantly and the bills are always there. Can't get ahead. Maybe you pick something physical like cancer. Chemo, the radiation, it's just like someone's pulled a plug on our family. We're just out of energy. We have no life left. Maybe you'd say it's infertility, John. We've, we've tried literally everything. We're exhausted. And we just want a baby. Or maybe you would say it's depression. I just feel like the sun's never going to shine. Like I just don't ever want to put my feet on the floor and take another step out of bed. Or maybe like Mary and Martha, you'd write the word death. Last 12 months, someone significant in your life passed away, and it's just not been the same since. You just miss them. I've been doing this long enough to know that there are some small things, but there are also some really big things. They have this unique capacity to create tension and be able to pull the family apart at the seams. So please hear me today. If there's anything bothering your household, you need to know it bothers Jesus a whole lot more. And the reason I can say that with a straight face is because of what happened when Jesus approached the tomb. When he saw how adversely affected the sisters were by the death of their brother, it just says, Jesus wept. We teach it to kids, almost in a joking fashion, shortest verse in the Bible, but friends, it's so powerful. When you struggle, he struggles. When you suffer, he suffers. When you feel pain, he feel pain, feels pain. When you cry, he cries. And I find comfort in that, not just for my own life, but when I'm trying to help others. I don't know if you've seen the movie, the documentary on Netflix called 14 Peaks. Uh, it chronicles the life of this Nepalese climber who's attempting to climb 14 mountains that are north of 26,000 feet in elevation. He's trying to do it in seven months or less. The previous world record was seven years, just to give it perspective. And they do a phenomenal job of chronicling the emotional and the physical toll that this is taking on this young man, and I won't ruin the ending for you. But this serves a purpose. I need you to have a visual in your mind of how big a mountain is. Because Jesus made a promise to you years ago, and he's kept every other promise. I think he meant to keep this one too. Listen to these words. If you, put your name after that, had faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. So let me put these words back up here. Addiction, divorce, bankruptcy, cancer, infertility, depression, death. Man, these things can feel like insurmountable mountains, too big to move, and they are if you don't invite God to help you and your family. But again, we believe God can do things we cannot do. And the reason we believe that is because we know the end of the story. We've heard it. Jesus approaches the tomb and it says he doesn't whisper or say it. He shouts it, Lazarus, come out. And a professor of mine in college said if he hadn't been specific in that moment, every dead person within 10 miles would have risen from the dead. <laughs> it's the kind of power we're dealing with here. Man, a stopped heart starts beating again, closed eyes open again. And a dead man walks out of a grave alive. And I wish in parentheses they'd said and the crowd went silent or the crowd started cheering and clapping. We don't know. But I'd be willing to bet a lot that those two sisters who had anger and sadness in their heart because of the death of their brother, that went away. That dissipated and there was joy that was replaced there. See, I know in the family structure, it was designed with intent and with purpose for all of us to get five things on a daily basis in big doses from our loved ones. And those five things are acceptance, affection, appreciation, approval, and attention. If we don't get these five things from our family members on a regular basis, we're lacking and that lacking causes sadness and anger to take root in the human heart. All of us have felt it. All of us have experienced it on some level. Now, I was listening to some talk radio years ago, and people were calling in around Christmas and sharing crazy family stories. And this one woman called in. She said on Christmas morning, she went down to her kitchen, and in the night, her mother-in-law had completely rearranged her kitchen. Forks were taken out of this drawer, put over here. Coffee cups out of this cupboard and put over here. And she was frustrated and her mother-in-law was just smiling. 
And her mother-in-law said, my gift to you this Christmas is a kitchen that makes sense. <laughs> so for the next 20 years, this daughter-in-law, every time she visits her mother-in-law, she says, I just move a few things at a time. Just turn the screws. Hey, people are crazy. They're crazy, and we're related to them, okay? We need to acknowledge that right now. It's truth. Yeah, someone's clapping. That's awesome. I heard about two cousins in Fort Myers, Florida. This is the story of the year. Got in a fist fight in their grandma's kitchen. You don't fight in grandma's kitchen. That's just a rule, okay? But they did. Grandma kicks them out. The fight spills over into the front yard. I want you to hear how the local news station captured this story. Garcia was charged with aggravated battery in connection with an altercation with his cousin who sustained injuries from a pocket knife. Authorities and witnesses confirmed that the argument was over whether almond milk was superior to whole milk. <laughs> Man, I am passionate about my 2%, but I'm not going to stab anybody over it. What are we doing out there? It's crazy. So here's what we need to do as mature followers of Jesus. Okay? First thing is, is we need to apologize quickly. If this isn't a rule in your household, it needs to be. None of us have been perfect. So know my love when I say this. It's just good to admit, I wasn't a good dad to you. I wasn't a good mom to you in that moment. Maybe you need to say I wasn't a good son or daughter, good brother or sister. You're just taking ownership. I hurt you. Sorry for how I treated you. I wish I could take back what I said, what I did, but I, I can't, so I'm wanting to make it right. If a family member comes and apologizes to you, you need to forgive quickly. Now, there's some misunderstanding about forgiveness that I want to clean up. Your heart's only capable of so much, and God understands that. So please hear this. When you forgive another person, it doesn't mean you need to immediately restore trust. Some people are not trustworthy. It doesn't even mean you need to spend time with them. Okay? Forgiveness is connected to freedom in the Bible. So when you give a person forgiveness, yes, you're setting them free, but most importantly, you're setting yourself free. You're saying, God, this person has taken something from me, and I don't want them to take any more, so help me forgive them so that I can be free. Now, in the same way that you can't change another person's behavior, God never forces change on another person. So you apologize, you forgive. Your dad might still be a jerk after it. Your mom might still be a control freak after it. Your siblings might still be mean and manipulative to you. That's not what this is about. So please hear this. If your family rejects you, God's family accepts you. One of the things you're going to hear consistently in this church is that you have a father who is good. And he's in heaven and his intentions for you on earth are also good. You also are going to hear here that you have an older brother in Jesus, and his love for you is better than anyone else's love for you, and you can trust him because he laid his life down for you. He valued you that much. You're also surrounded by some crazy relatives in this church. We've been through it in our own lives, and we've been through it together. We'll give you the shirt off our back. We'll give you whatever you need from us. And the reason we will is because we understand the very last verse of this story. This does not get preached on enough. After Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, he says, unwrap him. Unwrap him and let him go. I love this. Jesus is inviting the crowd to participate in setting Lazarus free. God has commanded us, this church, to help you. We just want to help you. Whatever it is that's holding you back and keeping you from moving forward in life, we're here for that. We signed up for that because we love you. We really do. Uh, give you an example, a widow. And anytime you lose a spouse, there's this just gut-wrenching loneliness. I've seen it in a lot of people. And this widow realized, I'm not gonna heal if I keep my attention and my eyes on myself. I need to get my attention on others. So she had this little creative burst and she made this little sign and she put it up outside of a dining room at a major college campus. I think this is so sweet. And the sign just said, if you're homesick, come to my house each Wednesday at 4 p.m. for dessert and coffee. She 
put her address at the bottom. The next Wednesday, she was shocked when 80 college kids came to her house. 80. I'm not shocked by that. In the same way, I'm not shocked that 22,000 people came to Easter services at Southland. And here's why. I've been doing this long enough. I've been doing this long enough to know that most people out there are looking for people who will look out for them. They're longing to belong. They just want to be a part of a family. And so church, let's not complicate what God intended to be so simple. Can I just ask you to love each other really, really well? Take good care of each other. Gary Black told me years ago in relation to my marriage, I'll never forget this advice, always be kinder than necessary. You don't know what the person in front of you or behind you or beside you has been through or is going through right now. 2004, I preached a very regular, vanilla sermon, hopped off stage, and a woman started limping towards me. I noticed the limp first. She got closer. I could see that part of her face was disfigured and she had on sunglasses, and she started to tell me why. She said, years ago, my husband came home from work, set his stuff down, and came in the kitchen to hug me as he normally did while I was preparing supper for our family, but this night, as he hugged me, he detonated a bomb. Meant to kill the two of us. Killed him, maimed me. And she said, I have a really hard time trusting people. In my young minister mind, I'm trying to figure out, man, what am I going to say? And then she said, I have a hard time sleeping at night. And understandably so. And then she said this, I just need to be hugged by a man who doesn't have a bomb strapped to him. I need to cross that hurdle today. I can do that. So I wrapped her up, hugged her, held on to her. I'll never forget it, friends. Be kinder. Always be kinder. The necessary, because we just don't know what people have been through. Now, there's a Japanese artist right now that's gaining global notoriety in the world of what's called miniature art. It takes everyday objects, like this last time was COVID mask, turns it into an ocean landscape. And I looked at that, it took me a second like it took you a second, and here's what hit me. I thought, he sees things I don't see. We need people in the world like that, don't we? Here's another one of his famous ones. This woman's just doing an everyday routine thing, ironing, getting the wrinkles out, turning ruffles into Pringles like that. (laughs) But I show you that to just say this. As you get to know people and as you attempt to love people, The little details matter in big ways. Let me say that again. The little details matter in big ways. I had a man tell me years ago that when he was a little boy, his dad would come home from work, sit in the recliner, watch the news, then some sitcoms, get hammered, drunk, and blackout. That was his routine every night. And as he was relaying his childhood memory to me, he was giggling, a nervous kind of giggle. We have a tendency when we're hurt to normalize and trivialize and sanitize what we should criminalize. No grown man should ever act like that in front of a little boy. Had a woman who grew up in Illinois tell me one time in the trailer park she lived in, down the street she used this terminology, was a honky-tonk, tavern. And her mom would go there on the weekends, get a different man and bring him home for the night. And I quote, she said, I would wake up as a little girl, go out to the kitchen table, never knowing what strange man was going to be sitting out there eating my cereal. I hear it all the time. Kids have had to be parents to their parents. No one should ever be robbed of a childhood at 8, 9, 10, or 11 years of age, but it happens all the time. And friends, those little details from way back, if they're not dealt with, they can hammer you in big ways as an adult. And Jesus cares. And I care, and this church cares. We just want to unwrap it and free you from it so you don't trip and stumble and fall and make the same decisions through the rest of your life. We want to help you take a dying experience and turn it into a life-giving experience. And with Jesus, my goodness, that's always possible. Always. Country of Mozambique. Went through a 15-year civil war. Million citizens were killed. I can't get my head around that sometimes. They finally negotiated a ceasefire and the government partnered with local churches and they told the soldiers on both sides, if you'll surrender your weapons, we'll give you, in exchange, farming equipment, tools. To their surprise, 600 soldiers gave up their, their guns. 
And they took these guns and they turned them into works of art. One of my favorites is a piece called The Tree of Life. They took AK-47s and shotguns and pistols and they just welded them together. This thing weighs a ton. But they set it on a trailer and they drive it from town to town to remind the people of Mozambique that we were in a place of pain. But now we're in a place of peace. And I saw that and I was reminded of the passage in Isaiah chapter 2. Listen to these profound (laughs) words from the prophet. The Lord, it's Yahweh, God, who we know as a father, will mediate between nations and will settle international disputes. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations will no longer fight against nation nor train for any war anymore. Why are people so angry? Where did all this pain in the world come from? Sad children become angry adults. And when angry adults don't know what to do with the pain, they fight. It's a human tendency. And friends, most people, most adults don't know what to do that, with that pain. They don't know they can take it to Jesus. So here's the reality. One in four adults in our country today are abusing alcohol on a regular basis. One in 20 today are com- contemplating suicide, meaning they're going, man, death would be better than living. One in six, battling crippling anxiety. There's this kind of combination of fear and worry, like there's just no hope, no good tomorrow. Here's an interesting one. One in five men and one in eight women have been or are actively involved in an affair. At this church, what we're inviting you to do is to lay your weapons down, quit fighting, and allow your life to become a monument of peace instead of a monument of pain. It's an invitation. It's your choice. Man, I pray you do it. I think as kids... In any American history class, we need to do a deep dive on war. We've had a lot of family members fighting war. I think we need to learn from it. And we need to study the men who are involved in it because a lot of great things have happened there. Here's two I want to introduce you to that you probably have never heard of. This is Kenneth Moore and Robert Wright. On D-Day, like thousands of young American men, they parachuted into the darkness. When their boots hit the ground, they didn't start shooting. They were medics trained to be doctors. So they started tending to the wounds of men all around them in the midst of the darkness. But then they found this little church building in Angoville, France. They turned this 900-year-old chapel into a makeshift ER and operating room. For the next 36 hours, they tended to the wounds of men. Didn't matter to them if they were Americans or Germans. Anyone that was brought in, they helped because they wanted them to have another shot at life. After a few days of intense fighting, the shooting stopped. And these men are credited with saving the lives of 80 men and one little girl from the village who was caught in the crossfire. When the villagers returned to their church for worship one Sunday, they were shocked to see that all the pews in the building were stained with blood. Seats, the backs, the sides, blood everywhere. And then they were told the story of these two American medics and what they'd done for their community and for other people, even total strangers. And they made a wise decision that day. They said, we're not going to clean that off. And if you go there and tour that little chapel in France, you're going to see those pews are still stained with blood. It's a visual reminder to them every Sunday that the church was intended, it was designed to be a hospital for hurting people. We don't have pews at South. They're stained with blood. But we do have chairs that are drenched in tears. I'm glad they are. This place continues to be a safe place for people to heal from their hurt. And most importantly, we have a leader, a Savior who cries with us. So friends, as we continue in this series, continue turning to Jesus for everything that you need that you don't currently have you will be so, so glad that you did. Let me pray for us. Father, I know from my own heart, my own life, that anger is an easy emotion to get to, but it's, it's usually, Father, born out of something, and there's always a source. 
God, it's sometimes easier just to take it out on others than to really figure out why we're, why we're so mad. So God, I just pray that we take the time today and this week, that you give us the courage we need to face stuff that's hurt us. Acknowledge it, take it to you and your son, knowing that if Jesus could raise people from the dead, there's nothing he can't help us heal from in this life. So God, I pray you, again, challenge us to lay our weapons down Quit shooting at each other. And God, just to love each other the way you've loved us. Father, I pray that some of my church family would have the courage to establish healthy boundaries, to walk away from some relationships that have not been good for a long time, take a break so that they can catch their breath. God, I pray they wouldn't feel guilty, they wouldn't feel shame in that. They'd recognize that's a wise thing to do sometimes. And God, I pray that you... Use all of us as adults to love kids, no matter what, every way we possibly can, recognizing that someday they're going to be adults. Father, we want them to be healthy and whole. We want to minimize regret in their lives. So help us, Father, to have the courage to love people, love kids especially, maybe even in ways we haven't been loved ourselves. We thank you for Jesus who taught us how to do all of this. And we pray this in his wonderful name. Amen. As we jump into our time of communion, I think that story of Mary and Martha and Lazarus is so fitting because as Jesus comes back into town, Martha meets him and she yells at him, Jesus, if only you were here, my brother would not have died. And this little cup, this communion that we take each and every week, it's a celebration of the opposite, right? Jesus, because you were here, we may have life. And that's what's packed into this little cup. And so on the way in, hopefully you grabbed one of these by the doors. If not, feel free to go grab one right now. But communion is a time for us as followers of Jesus to remember the death of Jesus, a death that was for us. And so there's a little cracker piece of bread representing his body and some juice representing the blood of Jesus. And we take these each and every week so that we can have our moment to remind ourselves that we've been bought at a price. The Apostle Paul says that every time we take communion together, we proclaim that we believe that Jesus died for us and that we are eagerly waiting for him to return again. And so as you do that this morning, that's what you're partaking and, and as you're doing that, we're going to have some verses on the screen that may help you focus and remember and center yourself on that sacrifice that Jesus made. There's going to be a number on the screen as well. and You can text that number. If you need anything to be prayed about this morning, feel free to text that number. There's very real people who would love to be praying for you. If you prefer face-to-face -face prayer, we'll have a team down front after the service, and they'll just be here available to pray over you if that's something that you need. But no matter what, let's take a moment and just center ourselves on the sacrifice that Jesus made for us.
Would you all please stand and sing this out with us? How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name. Through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. Beautiful finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my
Well, as always, there's going to be people down front here to pray with you, to talk with you if you need to do that. They'd be honored to meet with you. Come back next week, bring a friend, and we'll see you guys then.